Hi, good evening. Welcome to the live demo tonight. I will be starting here in just a minute, hoping for a few more people to join. I started this painting over on Instagram and um, just got a little bit going. I will post that video later on YouTube once I've reformatted it um, to match uh, the get a horizontal format. And um, so I, tonight I'm painting a young woman named Lex. Uh, I got her photo off of the app Sketchy, and um, you will see that in a second. And I see we got six people going, so um, or maybe five because I I'm one of them. So I will jump right in here and get going. Um, and so um, there's the photo in the beginning of the painting. This is a photo that was chosen by my Instagram followers out of a, a choice of four different photos. I usually give um, a selection of four. This one was chosen overwhelmingly over the other ones. And um, let me see, we got James here and uh, Marion Glazer from, um, from Base, St. Louis, Mississippi. And um, James is from Toronto. Great. And there's probably a few more out there, but that's okay. Yeah, no, um, no requirement to, to um, join the discussion. You're, ha you're welcome just to watch or watch and paint if that's what you're doing. And um, so I use, um, if you look at the photo and the uh, painting, they are the same size. I, I like to um, work site size, which essentially is your subject is the same size as the painting. I'm working 11 by 14 panel on a, um, this is a um, Mona Lisa gessoed panel that I put an additional coat of gesso, which is kind of necessary for these panels. Um, they're fairly inexpensive. You can buy them for this size, it's about $2 for 11 by 14 panel, which is a lot better than ampersand panels tend to run about seven to $10 in this size. So um, since I do a lot of paintings over the year, um, this for me uh, makes it somewhat economical and the quality is very good can, um, as long as you do put your own coat of gesso on it. So, um, yeah, so the, the Speedball Mona Lisa panels are much too slick. Um, I know a few painters who like it that way. Um, a friend of mine, Allison, who uses these panels, who um, does not gesso it, but she's just learned to um, paint on them. But they have um, zero absorbency if you, so you have to wait for the, the paint to dry on them um, I suppose you could be working uh, wet into wet for a long time on them if um, if you don't put gesso on them. The only problem I found is that when you go to put on subsequent layers of paint, these especially if you're using stiffer brushes, it tends to pick up the um, pick up the previous layers of paint, so it gets to be a little bit hard to control at some point. So I did a little bit of measuring and a little bit of drawing with the paint over on Instagram. And um, now I am just sort of painting in, um, approximating the colors and the values that I see. And um, let me see if I can turn this a little bit towards me so I have a better idea. And excuse me if I, um, I tend to bump, um, the phone is right next to me with the cord sticking out. I have a little bit of a clumsy setup. I have the phone on a mount, which is a, um, has a, it's a flexible cable that clamps to my desk. And I actually have it in a loop and I have a clamp on the loop. So it's not quite as springy as it, it would be. Um, as I, when I first set it up, I didn't have that. And anytime I, nudge the camera, it would bounce around for about five minutes. So even though it does bounce a little bit and has a little bit of give, it's not as bad as it could be. And um, I go, I'm doing these live um, demos just using my phone and um, the Wi-Fi essentially. I hope the quality is good enough. And um, 
so yeah, so the Wi-Fi connection, um, I've had problems in the past where sometimes the sound went out or sometimes the picture froze and I wasn't really paying attention to the, um, the feed to, to see, except for someone saying, hey, I think the, I think the photo, the image froze up over here. And I would go ahead and paint for another 10, 15 minutes before I noticed. Um, so you can hear um, from, I, I'm, I have a, a, a bright or a flat. This is a bright. Sometimes I wear down the flats enough so that they look like brights. Um, and you can hear that the, um, there's quite a lot of tooth to the surface. Like I said, I just put a light coat of gesso, but I don't sand it. And so um, I can, if I want, come in with a little bit wetter paint, but I'm just sort of um, kind of working the paint into the surface a little bit. This is, um, can give me kind of an even, uh, fairly even values in the beginning. And as I work towards the finish, I, st I will get thinner, thicker and thicker paint. And I like to keep my paint for control. Um, I like to keep it about the consistency of cream, just fair, just um, thick enough so that it's um, somewhat opaque or a little bit translucent, but not runny. And so I can keep on working wet into wet paint. And then as I go thicker, um, if you, if you want to have the color on the brush be the predominant color in the end, that it's not mixing with colors underneath, then you need to go thicker and use a softer brush is sort of the key to not getting quite as much uh, mixing with the underlying colors. But I want, in the beginning, I want a fair amount of mixing because that... Um, that will give me some of the nice ala prima effects that I'm looking for. So, um, so yo, Rob, Cleveland painting along, mate. Okay, um, you're in Cleveland, but you sound Australian. So, um, but maybe that's um, just reading into the to the phrasing there. So one thing a few people said who voted on the selection of this photo is that they didn't think that the mouth looked quite right. And um, I think that's, I use a lot of selfies and I think that's kind of um, indicative of a selfie is a lot of people will kind of push their lips out a little bit and I think that's a little, just a, a hint of what she is doing here, which is which is fine. I'm just going to paint it the way I see it, and um, sometimes I'll ch I'll change the expression just slightly, um, depending on whether it's a commission or it's just um, a study, which I do most of the time, or studies or demos, and. Um, sometimes it just needs something uh, a little bit changed or different. So just um, trying to sneak up on some of these values, um, just pulling, going lighter or darker as I go. And I can sort of indicate some of the highlights now. This will just give me a sense of surface quality. I can see on that far cheek I don't have it dark enough and then I have that line on the nose was just a little bit too prominent but now I kind of wiped it out a little bit so let's see if I can get that back. So already uh, you can see just very softly I'm starting to feel that a sense of the form coming coming out in just the few colors and values that I have right now. Let me go see if I can get a little bit red, more red influence on the side of her nose there. That was a little bit too strong, but you can always 
come back a little bit. Feel free to ask me any questions. I'm here to, you know, part of these demos is um, giving people inf the information. I'll just keep on talking, but if there's something specific you want to know, I'm happy to answer. If it's about the materials or the techniques or how I choose um, the models or the apps that I use or anything, any questions about social media too, I've um, started, now I have a, um, an Etsy account where I sell prints of my work and my originals and um, have been doing um, portrait commissions. Um, most of those I get off of Instagram, but have started to get some um, pricing requests on on Etsy. I'm also looking at doing um, some free and paid courses over on Teachable, um, but have not dived in completely yet on that. I think that's going to take a while for me to develop um, that um, those course informations, but it's going to be primarily on um, oil painting and portrait painting. And, but I will continue to do demos and post my work and answer questions um, for uh, on YouTube and Instagram just for my followers. And I'm also um, quite a, a few people um, ask me questions in the comments of my posts and also DM me for specific questions. And I'm again happy to answer any questions. Um, hey, commenting from Brooklyn, this is Jonathan. I'm wondering if you uh, could talk a little bit about the colors you are mixing and how to get from one color to another. Okay, so um, I'm going to see if I can tilt this down just a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm looking at a different um, setup for my live videos where I use a, um, um, like a video mixer that... Um, that I can have uh, more than one camera source and put graphics on the screen, etc. But I'm sort of stuck with this one for now. I've, I did a little test last week and it, and it didn't really work. Um, but so I choose my colors. I have all Gamblin um, artist um, oils, artist colors. These are the top of the grade colors that Gamblin puts out. They also have a student or studio grade that's called 1980 and those colors are okay for beginners but you won't get the kind of color intensity if you're looking for um, high tinting strength or um, very strong colors out of the tube they are pretty strong but the minute that you try to push them lighter or darker or start to mix them with other colors you're gonna lose the intensity so my color palette is a high key palette. I have a full spectrum of colors and I've chosen each color based on the highest tinting strength. So essentially the most, um, the strongest color that I can get with them out of the tube. And I, that gives me um, sort of the maximum possibility of color range that I can get. And um, and then by mixing black, white, or gray, or in some cases the complementary colors with those colors, I can get um, I can get different um, levels of intensity of the color. When I say intensity or chroma, I just mean essentially how bright the color is, um, as opposed to hue or value. And when I say value is essentially light, sort of uh, an alternate word for saying lighter or darker. So when you hear artists talking about um, color values, they're talking about on a, on a step between, um, between one and 10, one being the lightest or zero being the lightest and 10 being the darkest. Um, uh, the black would essentially be a 10 and white would be a, a zero, then um, you can create grays that are almost like keys on a piano or a scale, a musical instrument scale that go sort of the full range. 
Um, or you can have any hue go from completely white to completely black. Um, but um, there's only one point where that color is going to be the most intense, and that's essentially the out of the tube color. Um, there are some exceptions to that. There are some very transparent colors that out of the tube, it's really hard to see the color, but if you add a little bit of white to the mixture, like ultramarine, then, then you can then start to see the color popping out. And so ultramarine is one of those colors. Its most intense state is actually um, if you add a little bit of white to the color. And so I mix my colors based on what I see on the monitor. It's maybe a little bit hard for you to see the colors because when I look on, I think when I look on my monitor, the color um, is much more blown out. Oh, so now you get to see infinite, um, infinite versions of her back in time. Okay, so you get smaller and smaller as it goes. Anyway, you can see that her flesh tones here in the in my YouTube video monitor or window is much uh, lighter than what I actually see here. And it gets lighter and lighter as you go back. So what you're seeing is actually um, just because of my lighting setup that it is not um, is not calibrated for um, videoing the monitor, but better to see the, um, the colors on the actual painting, then you're not going to really um, be able to see all the colors that I'm seeing. It's only if you go back to look at the photo that I've posted on Instagram that you get a better sense of what that color looks like. And so I am, um, even though I'm painting from a monitor, um, it's all the colors there are set up to how I want to see them in paint. So I've uh, adjusted the colors. Sometimes it's a little bit more intense than I'm painting them, but that's more or less what I'm looking at for color. And then I'm pretty good at matching. Um, I have really good um, color mixing skills, and I can match just about any color that's within the intensity range that I can achieve. So I good at um, at judging values, colors, and intensity pretty well. And so if I wanted to, I can, I over time I could make this look fairly um, photorealistic or exact or um, be fairly close to what I'm seeing on the monitor. Granted that the monitor is, um, is an electronic medium and the painting is not. So there's always going to be kind of a, a little bit of a judgment difference. Um, it's not like you're holding a print next to a painting and you can say, oh, well, that's exactly this color. Because the monitor is just, it's a different um, type of lighting medium. So I don't know if that answered the question or not. Um, so James asks, how long um, you been painting me eight? Um, um, question mark, I guess. That, are you saying that you painted for eight years? Um, or, oh, she's saying mate. I get it. Mate. Um, so I've been painting for about um, a little more than 30 years. Uh, it's... Um, or, or pretty close to it. It's um, I really considered um, myself a painter by the time I left art school. When I started art school, I really didn't understand how painting worked. I had done some paintings with not a lot of success without understanding how colors and color mixing worked. And so when I did paintings, they were um, using all very intense colors. I didn't understand that um, that there needed to be neutrals and how to mix flesh tones using um, a modulation of, of colors, values, and intensities to get everything to look right. And so by, by the time I left art school, I did, I could can understand that better, the color theory, and then be able to, to control what I was doing. Um, but I painted on and off for the last 30 years 
I hadn't been painting consistently until really recently. I am painting close to 20 to 30 hours a week. I do have a full-time job, so um, I can't really paint more than that, but I've set up my schedule and these demos and um, so that I get enough painting in that the quality of my work progresses. And so that's really what's important to me. Um, and I also make sure that I'm painting exactly what I want to paint. Um, I used to try to uh, market my work much more aggressively, and that required painting what I thought the market wanted. And the unfortunate part of that is that I wasn't painting what I wanted and then would get tired and discouraged. And, and what I realized is that if I wanted to make this a, um, a joyful process, one that I wanted to do continually, and I needed to do it continually if I um, wanted to improve, that I had to um, take money out of the equation and just make it about painting things that I really wanted to paint. And when it came right down to it, I wanted to paint people's faces. Um, not necessarily to be a portrait artist. That's sort of a, I guess, a benefit is that people will commission me to paint portraits. Um, but it's more for me, I really enjoy um, painting faces. And I'll do a little bit of clothing and the things in the background. I've done quite a bit of landscape painting over the years, but I'm doing less and less over time. Um, and so for me, the key is um, just um, finding, figuring out what you enjoy to do, to paint. And then um, the rest, I think, will follow. Especially um, for me, improvement of my work is, is one benefit of figuring out really what I wanted to paint. And I found that until I did that, I was really I'm frustrated because my work was not improving and I just wasn't spending enough time doing it for it to improve. Anyway, so it's about 30 years. Um, so um, what app do you use for your models? So I um, use an app called Sketchy. It's S-K-T-C-H-Y. There's um, S, sorry, S-K-E, yeah. I said it right the first time. S-K-T-C-H-Y. No E in there. And it only works on Apple phones um, and Apple devices, unfortunately. Um, I think they talked about trying to make an Android version, but they don't have the kind of staff required um, to make the leap to Android devices. So even though they'd like to, it's just really not in the cards, but um, if you're really interested um, in getting more resources then, and you don't have an Apple device, find someone who has one and borrow their, their phone and look through it for a little while. And it's literally thousands of photos being downloaded every day um, for, I don't know, about thousands, hundreds every day um, by people who want their photos um, painted and drawn and um, some to various um, degrees of quality some are better quality than others and I have a little bit too much um, gal kit mixed with the black there so that's why it's looking a little bit thin so just gotta um, pump up the, the thickness of the paint a little bit and I gotta clean that up okay and so um, I would say about 90% or more of the resource images that I use are from that app, Sketchy. And I've, I get a few off of Instagram, but not that many. And um, sometimes I look on Pinterest, but um, I don't know. I, I like to know that I have the the owners, the person who took the photo, I have their permission to use the photo for doing the painting. And so 
sketchy kind of takes that um, takes that question out of the equation. Every photo on there, at least according to the person who posted it, is their um, it's their property. It's their intellectual property to be able to grant um, usage to be able to do paintings. Just wondering about this measurement in here from the corner of the eye to the ear. Yeah, that's about right. Let's measure to the to that um, don't even know what you call that piece of anatomy to the flap in the ear. So that's that's right. I need to get a little bit of blue in the flesh there. So it looks like kind of ultramarine there. I've got a little purple, too much purple in there, but that's okay. It's not, it's not horrible. I can always um, knock it back a little bit. And then there's a little bit of greens and yellows coming in after that. Then I have the hollow of the cheek, a little bit of orange in there. It's a little bit darker towards the hairline. That's going to help give me that volume of that cheek. Then I get a bit of red across there. This is where that cronacridone red comes in handy because I can go fairly light and still get a little bit of um, a little bit of chroma out of it. And then in the um, chin, there's a little bit of that, but um, then it quickly goes to yellows and greens around. Um, around the muzzle of the mouth. And then typically there's a little bit of a darker area here where the chin and the and the jaw and the um, the anatomy around the mouth and then the and then the cheek meets. So here's the bottom of the cheek right here. So as long as I um, adjust those values correctly, I am going to get something that looks like that um, that cheek turning in space. Let me just knock that back a little. Okay, still looks a little cartoony, partially because I don't really have the eyes um, quite done enough. I'm going to switch to a little bit softer brush so I can get a little bit um, more paint going here on the on the canvas and maybe just get a little on the canvas on the panel and just get a little bit more control going. Okay, just get a little more information in the iris here. She has um, kind of greenish blue eyes. Not a lot of color, but just enough that you can see it. And then uh, quite a bit of um, eyeliner going here. I um, So I had a few pictures of Lexi in my queue in Sketchy. And she had her hair um, cropped, almost shaven and also a bleached blonde, or kind of a coppery color. And then um, later she grew her hair out and let it, um, and then dyed it black. And if you look at the different photos of her, it's really hard to tell that it's the same um, person in a way. Um, just need to get a little bit of the darker blue at the top of the eye and then a little bit of the red as it um, goes into the corner. This will help um, build the volume. And then I just need like a highlight here as it gets closer. So trying to build a sense of volume of the eye. There's also on the eyelid itself is, um, is a gradation. She has a, a fair amount of um, metallic eyeshadow on, on the, in the 
and that's actually going to exaggerate that a little bit with the sheen of her eye as long as I don't get too messy with it okay, I'm not control my breath a little bit there to get the accuracy Okay, I hope I have the eye in the right place because I have put a little bit of energy into it. So I'm just going to do a quick bit of measuring. Um, so, corner of the eye. It's a little hard to measure when I don't have, see the full thing. Okay, so let's try that again. Corner of the eye there. That's spot on from the top. And from the top, that's pretty good. Okay, so that eye is in the right place. I can see the other eye. I, guess I do need to pull in the, the iris a little bit. Okay, so James says, I noticed that you started the painting with several high-value colors. Um, is it tricky to darken such high-intensity colors? Um, and to darken, um, I, I think what you're saying is, it, is it tricky to make them duller, to lower the intensity? And the answer is no. Um, the tendency is that by mixing, the more you you let the colors mix in the panel, the the lower um, the intensity is going to get because you're you're tending to mix different colors together, and by nature that's going to make them uh, a little bit less um, less have less chroma or less intensity. Um, so. The trick is, for most people, is keeping the intensity of color where they want it. So I think that's um, that's your next question is, I tried to follow your practice, but I ended up with muddy colors. And I think muddy colors isn't too bad because there are lots of places in a painting where you do have neutrals, but you also do want to be able to have the intensity of color where you want it. And so I actually think that most people don't realize it, but the, um, the problem they have with paintings tends to be that the, the values are, um, they're losing the value structure of the painting, meaning that the darks, um, the shadow area gets too light and the light area gets too dark. And so it no longer has a sense of light um, because even in a black and white photo, you can have a feeling of light even if there's no color. But if in a color painting you don't have um, the value structure that it's falling apart, then it, it does look like, um, it will start to look lackluster. And so the question is, are you, um, are you keeping a good contrast throughout the painting between light and dark? Are, is your darkest dark dark enough? Is your lightest light light enough? And is there, um, are you maintaining a good value structure throughout the painting where the lightest light in the shadow is darker than the darkest light in the light area of the painting? Now here in her face, there isn't any shadow except for um, under her nose here, underneath her chin. But this, these shadows are very important to tell the viewer how much, how light, how strong the light is on her face. If you take those shadows away, then the face, the colors will end up starting to look kind of dull. Um, by virtue of the fact that it doesn't feel like the face is being lit anymore. And so you do have to pay attention to those, um, those sort of things to get, get the feeling of a sense of light. Um, 
by the same virtue, I have to look at what is the what is the temperature difference between her the top of her head and the bottom. And in this case, uh, it's pretty even. Um, but a lot of faces, like there'll be one area of the face that's much hotter. When I say hotter, has much more of a feeling of light hitting on the surface than the other areas. And so, um, you just have to be a little bit um, observant of that to really get uh, the sense of form overall. So I'm going to come in with a little bit of red in the hairline. That's sort of this transition color that's happening um, as, um, as her hair starts to recede. You do see kind of reds and oranges coming in before it goes to black. And so this is going to tell the eye that um, you're looking through a little bit of the hair before um, to see the skin tones before it actually gets so thick that you can't see the skin anymore. Okay, so James, I tried to follow. Okay, so I already answered James's questions. I think. Um, uh, does it ever get easier? Che asks. Um, I think with a lot of practice, that's, uh, I think what I've been saying is that um, I struggled a lot um, actually with portrait painting and um, it actually took a concerted effort both uh, time-wise and trying to understand um, my materials better and sort of master um, that, mast um, get a good painting set up that was helping me succeed so that um, so that each time I came to sit down at a painting there were specific problems that I was trying to solve or certain um, competencies that I was trying to master and um, so over time I could see even though from painting to painting I wouldn't necessarily see an improvement but overall if I went back further back over a further period of time I could see quite um, a bit of leaps from from one painting period or one uh, stretch of time to the other and so yes it gets better um, you just have to um, you have to just decide that you want to um, invest the amount of time required to to um, it improving and also looking for ways that um, that you can master better master your the skills required. So that's actually one reason why I'm starting to have started doing the videos on YouTube and posting on Instagram to give people more information, but also why I'm also now thinking about doing additional courses um, through Teachable, um, where I can dive into much more uh, granular information. Okay, so I have a little bit of adjusting to do in the cheek and in the around the mouth and the nose. I kind of feel like there's some things that are just a, enough off that um, that I'm missing some of the sense of connectedness between one area of the face and the other. And so, just uh, sometimes it's just a matter of slowing down and comparing which it's really hard to do when you're doing a painting demo, but um, it's, it's how, how I fit, get these things to finish. It's really looking back and forth between the photo resource and the, and the painting to see where things are different. So partially to answer James' question when um, he says that um, it gets muddy is that I have no problem changing one area of the painting from one color one value to a completely different color and value so if I see that I want something to be darker lighter more colorful a different color then I'm able to control the paint enough to be able to do that and so I th think between 
the problems and uh, value structure and then also um, not being able to control the paint in a certain way is um, is making it difficult to get to where you want to go. So you may be able to see like, oh, I see exactly the color I want, but you're not able to get it to put it down on the panel or on the canvas, that color that you're looking for. And that's, so that's a completely different issue. That's one of, of control. And, um, and, and that comes with understanding your materials and a lot of practice to, um, to get, to be able to see a color up there, you know that color, be able to mix it and um, put it down on the panel and have it mix with the colors that are up there already to, to get exactly the color that you want. And you can see that I'm working fairly rapidly. That's just um, partially so that I can move this thing along. Um, but a lot of times it's just about slowing down and really just getting um, getting a level of precision that you need to be able to get things just the way they need to be. So I went a little bit too dark there towards the tip of the nose, so heck, I can just come in with pure white and just start to lighten it up to where I need it to be. If it gets too gray, then I can come in with a little bit of the Grenacridone Red, paint that into there a little bit, just a little bit. starting to get there. So again, a little bit too dark. I try not to do too much blending, but then again, I want to do color mixing. So I think what I try to do is always have just a little bit of paint on the brush each time, not just moving um, paint around with, uh, with an empty brush. I think a painting can start to look over blended if you're not careful. <clears throat> so let's see if there was any questions that I missed. Um, Jay, I answered Jay's question, James, and okay, that's it for now. I, I see there's 15 people here. Um, I welcome you to let me know where you're tuning in from. If you have any questions, please ask them. Um, otherwise, I will just keep on rambling to uh, whatever comes to mind. And I don't know if some of you came over from Instagram. I did do the beginning of this painting over on Instagram and invited people to come over here. Um, it's I have most of my followers over on Instagram, not on YouTube, so I like to do a little bit over there for my followers, encourage them to come over here too if they want to see me continue painting. Um, but I do now have about 1,100 or 1,200 followers on YouTube. I have not really been that focused on growing my YouTube channel, um, so it's been growing slowly. I've been doing these um, these demos over the last six months or so, maybe a little bit longer. Started off just doing um, short tutorials, <clears throat> but um, I think if I were doing both the tutorials and the demos, my channel would grow a lot faster. I just don't really have the time, uh, especially if I don't want to give up my painting time to do it. It's kind of be silly to try to do tutorials on painting and I'd have to not paint to do them. <laughs> so um, that was that's kind of a no-go. <clears throat> so oh, I see some other people tuning in. Um, Sanji, um, hi again from um, Bangladesh um, and Diane uh, um, on YouTube. Um, from Texas, welcome, and uh, Mario from Mexico, welcome, buenas, buenas noches, and uh, Jonathan 
to hear from Instagram, would love to hear you talk more about your process. Um, for example, do you try to paint um, dark from light, certain features, etc. So, um, so no, I don't try to paint from dark to light. I know a lot of um, painters that do that. It's sort of a natural um, process where you put in a lot of dark colors and then you keep on adding white slowly until you get um, the value structure that you want. And um, partially because it's easier to make dark colors lighter than the than vice versa. Although I, I don't feel like I have problems going either way. Although I do have to say that once you have too much white in your um, dark areas, sometimes it's hard to clean that up. Um, so sometimes it's um, you have to be um, you have to be careful not to get too much white in areas that you know are going to be very very dark. So um, so how do I paint? Um, so I, so I, I kind of work in two different ways. One is that I'll go from area to area, especially if I feel like I'm fairly have, uh, I'm confident in my landmarks and I'll paint um, kind of from center outward and work out that way and then just go and start to paint shape to shape as closely to the values as I can. And then I'll do several passes where I'll restate those colors and add in a little bit more detail as I go. So that's sort of one way. Another way is that um, I'll, I'll simplify the face or the head into two or three values and put all, just do the whole face and just a couple of values. And then, um, come back and adjust those values to get sort of the more subtle color and value changes. And um, and I think probably what I do is I paint somewhere in between those two, is that I'll, I'll paint very roughly the whole face, but I'll be looking at colors and values as I go. And then I'll come sort of have a general sense of the face and the form that I can really start to see it and compare it to the photo. And then I can go um, start to adjust everything, everything that I see that's like is greatly different than the photo. I go and adjust those areas first. Um, so if you see me, if you see one of my time lapse videos, it looks like I'm working on all parts of the painting at the same time. And um, it's, it's really kind of funny to watch because I'll be painting an eye, I'll be painting a cheek, I'll be painting the chin. And um, there's no rhyme or reason or order except for that's where I can see that there's the most difference, the most um, something that has to be really um, changed quite drastically to start to match um, what I'm seeing in the reference. Um, but then there's other times where I'll spend uh, quite a deal of time in one small area, and I'll just keep on working and working. Um, I try not to do that too much because it's really easy to have an area look overworked. And the, mo the more that you can um, that you can avoid that, to have the painting look more and more spontaneous, the better. Can see here she has just a little bit of her earring showing. I have to decide whether I want to keep it like that or maybe I'll just bring it out a little bit further so that it's clear what it is because um, otherwise it's going to look really um, confusing right there. And so that's sort of then uh, can be kind of a design choice and I'm just going to indicate it a little bit there and clean up the perspective, make it a little bit more um, oval. Okay. So that's where I'm going with that. Um, so, so that's sort of how we work. Not really dark to light, but everything at once. Um, if I see a dark area, I'll paint it dark. If I see a light area, I'll paint it light, and then all the areas in between. But um, really, um, 
the quickest that I can get to um, starting to see the form and starting to see um, the relationships between one area and another and then start comparing that to the photo, um, the better. So that's sort of what I'm after in the beginning of the painting, but towards the end I'm really looking at um, closing the gap between what um, what is going on in the resource and what's in the painting. And sometimes the I'll like what's going on in a painting more than what's going on in the photo, so I just leave it. Um, not really um, mess around with it too much. And also on my palette, what will happen is naturally I'll have little pools of color, some lighter, some darker, some different colors. And um, I will, depending on what color that I'm trying to get, I will be working into one pool or another. If it's a light pool that has uh, warm colors in it and that's where I'm headed, then I'll pull from that pull, pool. If I needed to adjust it towards one color or another, I'll, I'll add colors into it until it starts to look closer to the color that I want to paint. And, and this is a, a, the time in the painting where I start doing a lot more squinting because I'm trying to see um, the bigger shapes, the bigger um, effects, and that just uh, takes a lot of um, fine-tuning and seeing um, when I squint I can see better both in the photo and in my painting uh, what's going on. So I need to go a little bit darker in the hollow of that cheek. I want to keep it kind of in the orange family. And I can mix orange, um, permanent orange and naphthal red with the black. The black will push that naphthal red a little bit um, warmer. So that's why I've added a little bit of red to that mixture it's, instead of it going kind of on the greenish golden um, hue. The red is really to counterbalance the shift that the black um, um, influence has on the orange. Okay, I feel like I have her nose a little bit too long and um, not pointed out enough. If I can see that distance here, the tip of her nose is right around here. So I'll go ahead and adjust that. Oh, and I need to bring the shadow in a little bit. I think that's better. That already feels better. And then I also have to adjust her cheek line too at the same time. So that's little things like that, that was kind of throwing my, um, the f giving me the feeling that was something was not quite right in the, in the drawing. So that's, that's helping. So, and I have, um, so a few more questions here. Um, yeah, so I think I answered Jonathan's question um, for the most part. If not, um, please uh, ask me a follow-up question. Um, Diane asks, how long have I been painting professionally? Well, <laughs> that's a tricky question. So I've been painting proficiently, I guess you can say, for about 30 years and on and off professionally. I've um, painted as an illustrator in New York in the early 90s. I've um, had uh, gallery shows when I lived in Ecuador in the, in the late 90s. Um, and also did illustration when I lived there. And I've been painting on and off since I've had 
done in early 2000, mid 2000s. I did a lot of plein air painting and um, competed in a lot of um, plein air competitions. And then I stopped painting for maybe about five years because I was mostly discouraged, I guess, with not being able to market my work that easily. And then there was the recession and um, but what I was feeling was that I was a little bit um, frustrated with my work, not um, not developing, not the, I, I felt that I was a good painter, but I felt like my skills were not improving over time. And if I wanted to be able to sell my work, I was not able to really compete in a very crowded market. Um, but beyond that, I kind of felt like um, I was not, didn't enjoy it as much as I felt like I should. And so I went about five years of not painting, but really with the idea that um, I wanted to take money out of the equation, that I wasn't, um, that it wasn't enough to um, paint works of art to sell that I had to find um, the passion in it for myself and regardless of I, whether I sold the work or not. So kind of I needed to find the what was important between me and the in the painting, sort of me sitting down to paint, what was important there about it, not whether I could sell the work or not. and. So it took a long time for me to figure out what that was. And I came back to, I really wanted to paint people's faces. I really didn't care whether I sold the work or not. I really wanted the work to improve. So I set about um, painting on a regular basis, um, cut back on plain air painting, cut back on other types of painting, um, cut back I want to say I cut back on trying to market my work, but I found that I've um, been marketing my work pretty um, pretty steadily on social media and finding an audience there for my work. So um, just I just feel like that that process has been a little bit more organic, and so I've been pretty happy. I have a full time job, and so. Any painting I do is um, after hours with the full-time job. I mean, my wife works and I work, and so that means that um, there is no dire need for me to sell my work. There is no dire need for me to um, get portrait commissions, for example, or sell prints, or, um, or now I'm talking about um, having courses paid, um, but at the end of the day, those don't have to be hugely successful, um, and especially if it means that I am um, forgetting painting or stop enjoying painting. So I, I'm very mindful that it's all about um, the pleasure of painting, my passion of painting, and so I don't think of it as kind of, of painting professionally, although that is is what I'm doing, um, but I think about it as I'm just trying to be the best painter that I can be and not worry about, um, you know, if you look at it, I'm not really producing any studio paintings, meaning that I'm not producing paintings that I can sell in a gallery, just not really interested in doing that. Um, because it's not the kind of painting I want to do. So I have a lot of friends who say, oh, when are you going to show your work? And I'm like, never, never going to show my work. <laughs> people are already seeing it. So I paint it, I put it on Instagram, 25,000 people see it. And um, so why do I need to frame it up and lug it into a gallery and try to um, sell it to people coming into the gallery off the street? Um, just to me, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, doesn't fit what I'm doing, so I just um, don't worry about it. Just I'm just continuing to paint for my social media audience and calling it a day. So, um, 
let me see. Um, haven't been paying attention to the feed. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so Diane, I hope that answers your question kind of in a roundabout way. Um, Bryden as uh, tuned in to your weekly tutorials as also, always, I'm always ready to ready now before the um, bell reminder rings laugh out loud. Okay. Thank you for tuning in Brian, Bryden. Um, silver black. Yeah. Yes. I um, like what you're saying. If you're not passionate about it, how are other people going to be passionate about it? I couldn't agree more. Um, I think that um, I th think that's sort of where people kind of um, fall out of love <laughs> with um, with their art, as I can if I can put it that way. They sort of lose that lose their way a little bit, and um, I can remember. Um, a time where I was um, plein air painting and I was competing in a lot of competitions but I there was some artists there that were doing extremely well they were winning the awards they were um, selling their work in the competitions they were getting um, offers from galleries to be able to show their work and I was doing none of that and I was thinking uh, what I need to do is be able to and just work really hard and improve my work and I will get there and uh, but those competitions really ended up taking a lot out of me it was on top of a full-time job that was very stressful and um, and at the end of the day I found that I wasn't enjoying what I was doing and on top of that I started to talk to some of the artists that were selling their work and were um, winning some of the awards and um, how they were doing financially and I kept on getting the same response back that they um, weren't making as much money as they needed to to really um, to really um, do pay the bills or do well they were depending on other sources of income or spouses to be able to cover the difference um, and or have to live kind of very meagerly you know make sure that they kept their expenses very low and what I started thinking to myself is I'm killing myself trying to get to the level that they are so that I could have some of the success that they're having and then talking to them what I was beginning to realize is that they weren't feeling terribly successful at least financially and um, and at that time I was trying to figure out how to make enough money that I could quit my day job and, and then I began to realize like no this is I'm not even going to get there there is there was no path there and so that's when I just had stopped decided to stop painting altogether um, because I was really doing it for the wrong reasons and when I wasn't getting the level of, of success or I couldn't visualize how I would get there then it really just took the, the wind out of my sails and that's when I stopped painting for about like I said for about five years and so that's really where I came down to like I had to figure out if well I stopped painting, uh, but I w had this feeling like I wa I felt like that I was selling myself short in a way that I had the skill and I had I had the ability and the knowledge, but what I didn't have was the the amount of drive that I really had when I was in art school to really develop my skills further to really improve greatly and that's kind of what I felt like is even though I was doing all this plain air painting all these competitions um, I had been doing shows prior to that but what I wasn't doing was um, growing as an artist and so that's where I kind of felt like I had some regrets that I just didn't wasn't pushing myself to grow as an artist and so that's where it really came down to that I had to figure out 
what it is that I wanted to do as an artist first. What it is that I would stay up till midnight or two in the morning, um, almost every night on a work night and work and paint throughout the weekend um, when I could without um, without interfering with you know my doing things with my family etc and chores and errands and all those things but um, <clears throat> but what what is it that I wanted to do what is it that I wanted to paint that would um, make it so that I would could for the rest of my life paint um, on a certain schedule and so what it came down to me is that I really really just wanted to do what I'm doing right now as not overly rendered um, studies of people's faces just just this just exactly what I'm doing in this demo nothing more nothing less and that's what I've been doing for the last two and a half, three years, is just this kind of painting. Um, and you, when you talk to people, it's like, oh, you, well, you can't just, you can't do that. No one's going to buy those. And so my answer was, I, I really don't care. That's, this is what I want to be painting. So I don't, I don't need to be doing anything else. And um, so for me, that's the right answer. It's like, this is what I want to do. Um, kind of like Bob Ross in a way, you know, he's happy just painting those, you know, made up landscapes. He could just do a thousand of those and, and die happy, which I think he did do. And so nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, so Diane's, okay, I lost <laughs> my um, thread here. Okay, so um, so yes, yeah, Silver Black said um, you, that how are other people going to be passionate about it if uh, if you aren't? Um, Brian said, good point. Diane, I love that great explanation. I love to hear artist stories. Um, Mario Olive, Oliveto, um, Chin could use a little more rounding. I'll get there eventually. I'm just um, still in the playing phase. Um, and um, if you could get the type of microphone that um, pins to your shirt, it would be a lot easier to hear you talk. Okay, I, um, I do need to invest in some equipment I've been trying to figure out. I've um, been playing around with my setup for a while. And, um, and my, first, uh, my first tutorials were horrible because I was using the phone's microphone and um, and it was just horrible. And um, so now I have at least one that's um, a part of a headset, so it kind of stays close to me, but I may be spitting a little bit too much into it. Um, part of the problem is that um, that the YouTube Live, um, at least by using your phone, doesn't give you a whole lot of options. It expects you to use your phone. I bought a special attachment to my phone that I could plug in a USB microphone. Um, I looked a little bit into the um, lapel ones, but I was afraid that um, it would be too far from my face because then it would be at least a foot further, so it would pick up a lot of the ambient noise and not be loud enough. Um, part of the problem with live videos is that you don't have an opportunity to clean up the audio and, and heighten the, the, the volume, etc. And um, so you just kind of have to be come up with something that's going to work. And when I'm painting, I can't really sit still. Um, I'm moving back and forth a lot, so it has to be attached to my body in some way. So yes, maybe um, one of the lapel ones, but um, not sure that that would be so much better. Um, I could invest in a very expensive mic, or more expensive mic, like one of the Rode, um, one of the Rode mics, yeah. 
I do have something quite a little bit off on the chin, so I think I need to pull it out a little bit. That's sort of what I'm seeing when I squint down, that her chin is a little bit further out. <coughs> Don't have enough, not dark enough quite yet in this area on the side of the mouth as it comes up. Okay. And, yeah. So, and I don't like the, quite the shape of the mouth yet. So, all those things, this is sort of where I end up um, spending a lot of time, is sort of these small adjustments to the face. Um, what's helpful, I haven't done it yet, is to pull out the mirror. Oop, sorry about that. And it looks like my battery is not charging, so I do have to check this out if you bear with me a second. Um, yeah, how do I do this? Um, cannot see my... Let's see if I can... I'm sure it's charging. Sorry! Um, I am going to put the video on pause just a second so I can see. Okay, I'm back. Um, or at least it says I'm back. Um, so my battery is down to 8%. I don't know what's going on here. It's not really um, charging completely. So at some point, um, if the video, if my phone stops charging altogether, if my phone um, battery dies, that's going to be the end of it um, for the night. So I'm just going to hope that um, me unplugging and replugging the battery has um, meant that it's now charging. And um, But unfortunately I can't see, um, while the, the live feed is going, I can't see the battery level. A little bit of a, of a flaw in the system there. And so, um, yeah, I have a lot of kinks to work out in these demos, but um, but they're not horrible. And but at some point, I'm going to level up so that um, pe more people can get more out of them. <coughs> oh, so I don't know what's going on with the sound. Um, for some re for some reason, the sound is not coming through. I don't know if I don't know if this is any better, but um, the I didn't have any problems with the sound, and it could be a problem with the headset. I think is slowly dying. I'm I'm really sorry about that. Um, so, and Diane says I can hear him fine. Okay, so I don't know what the story is with the sound. Um, so um, I am going to. Um, keep on painting then. And I see that... So one thing that I'm having a hard problem with tonight is that um, I have to turn the um, panel a little bit towards the camera. Probably could shift it a little bit towards me. And um, to kind of get it right in my vision and then Ideally, I want both the monitor and the panel pointed right at me so that when I'm comparing them, I don't really have a parallax view of them, that I'm looking at them straight on, so that I can compare them directly. And so what I can see is right now that this measurement is, is quite a bit off. Can you, can you see that? So I need the, I need the jawline to be actually here the ear to start right about there and that um, and then the neck so if I adjust those things that's going to help me a bit and then I have to take this measurement again over on the side so from the nape of the neck to the side is right here so you can see I'm actually having a hard time getting the black 
to pick up on the panel there. It's gotten a little bit too smooth. And then the front of her neck, so it's not, then it's not feeling like it has the right thickness. It's right up here. And that means that her chin then has to come out a little bit further like that. So I think once I start to adjust all those things, bring the hairline up and bring the back um, of her head back a little bit further, then the, the gesture and the pose is going to start to feel um, right. So um, I, and I know a lot of people do this, I'm not the only one, is I tend to skew um, my proportions, meaning that if I were to paint what would be a square on here, that square would turn into kind of a diamond that's shifted in a particular direction. Tends to, the top tends to be shifted over the bottom the other way and the, the side tends to shift down on that side. And the only way to correct that is to measure, um, sort of to be very uh, thorough about your measuring and also to use a, a mirror. And I have this little um, hand mirror here. Um, sorry, this hand mirror that I use. And um, what I do with that is I just, um, here, let me flip this a little bit so you can see it. Um, is that the flip? Okay, so what I do is that I, I just put it along the um, the side of my eye and I and then I look at the painting with that and then very quickly I where my brain skews um, I see it as just the opposite so I very quickly see where an eye is too low where I've um, shifted things over where I've skewed things and um, because your brain naturally will shift in a particular direction and that um, the mirror will allow you to see the exact opposite and so that shift becomes very pronounced when you see it through a mirror it's um, but it's not so obvious if you if you don't see it that way um, i don't know if you watch a lot of um, digital painters though when they're working in procreate or some other applications um, as they're working, it's actually, um, it records them as they work, so they're able to make a time-lapse um, playback when they're all done. And what I notice is a lot of them are doing is when they work, they'll, um, they'll flip the work, which they can do. It's, it would be the same as looking in the mirror, but they flip the work, and then they flip it back. So they're able to very quickly see, see that. Um, I don't look in the mirror enough. I get a little bit lazy. I think part of it is I don't want to know how far off my my drawing is, um, and so that um, and then I put it off for too long. And then when I finally look at a piece in the mirror, I'm kind of just shocked that I um, that I let the the um, the drawing get so far off. So that's um, but it's a good practice I know a lot of artists will have a mirror installed in their studio right um, behind them when they're painting so that they can often just look behind them and see the painting and it also allows them to see the painting at a greater distance so it's the um, the analog of uh, squinting it does the same thing as when you squint that um, that allows you to reduce the level of detail so that you can see very quickly where um, the way things look, um, where um, where the painting's off, or where it's different than the the, the resource image, and um, allows you to see like dimensionally like where the where the values are falling apart. So got a lot of blue in the paint right here, and I got too dark. Um, so I can keep on doing passes of a light pink until I eventually get um, closer to that color and value that I'm looking for. 
if I want to, if it just um, has too much color um, underneath a paint to overcome, then I can just come and just take some of the paint off and, um, and then start like that. So then I'm almost back to the panel itself. And then, so then coming in with the light pink is a lot easier. <clears throat> okay, so let's get some of the neck in. And I, trying to keep this to an hour and a half, I'm finding that's sort of the, the optimal amount of time before um, people start to drop off and I start to get too tired and start making mistakes. And I do have to be, you know, be out of the house at, um, at 6.45 for a carpool and then to get to work. So don't want to make it such a late night. And I have to say, after I do these demos, it's very hard for me to get to sleep afterwards. Um, because I just know that, you know, I'm live, I have to be on and try to get this painting uh, done and moved along and not be horrible. <laughs> so, um, sorry, my easel got a little bit loose here, so it's wanting to move around too. It's, um, I have one of these, um, my, I, my, I, I can't talk, um, my easel setup, it's called an EZL, and it has a, um, a screw that you can screw, uh, a, in a camera holder and to an easel, sorry, to a tripod, and it has one of these fast, um, quick release things in it. And those quick release things, if you turn it the wrong way, then they just uh, they just start to loosen up. And I'm finding that when I'm trying to move my, uh, see my panel from a slightly different angle and I move the, I rotate a little bit, then the whole thing starts to get loose and there's no way to really tighten it. And so as I'm painting this, this whole thing is just starting to move around a lot more. So this is one of my, um, one, one way that I'm fighting my setup a little bit. I, I am here in a tiny little room that's, um, that's, uh, 12 by six feet. It's the mud room just off the kitchen. I share this room with some shelves, a wardrobe, a cat box, and um, and it, my whole setup is on a computer desk with the easel next to it. So that's my that's my studio, and I kind of like it in a way because it is right by the kitchen. I'm the cook in the family. I can make. Um, stop and make food for people and then get right back to painting and um, or if I'm thirsty or hungry I can just stop and I'm right there. Um, I know some people who like the idea of having a, a studio apart apart from their life apart from their house so they can work undisturbed and um, that doesn't work for me very well because I don't have the time to travel back and forth and and nor can I really isolate myself completely from my family and, um, and paint for 12 hours at a time or eight hours at a time um, because eventually that, that just is not, not going to work. So um, I like the fact that I'm here, I can paint I can start painting and I can stop painting quickly. I have my setup where the paints are wet and the brushes are out and I can just go. So, um, is there any last questions here while I'm um, getting sort of the middle part of this painting? Um, I will probably be finishing this offline and, but this is, um, this is about where I've gotten it to. Some paintings are very close to being finished at, um, in this amount of time. This one um, is not, but that's okay. 
I will put to get this together as a time lapse video too, and then put the finished painting down at the at the very end of it, and then hopefully people will think, oh, it was almost done anyway. <laughs> because a lot of the painting at the end is just really little small adjustments until everything starts to gel. Um, for the most part, the painting is kind of 90% uh, the colors and values of what it's going to be, but uh, most of the adjustment comes sort of fine-tuning the drawing and, um, and fine-tuning the values. And that kind of is what makes all the difference, that fine-tuning. Because, you know, okay, right now it's a mediocre painting. It's looking a little um, um, Malcolm Lipke-ish um, in sort of in that direction. Um, but it's not really where I want the painting to, to end up. Let's, let's see if I can get a little more paint on there for the highlight on the nose. Okay, this is where I need to shift to my softer brush so I can just get a nice thick dab going there. Okay. So, um, Sanjeev says, wondering how many viewers are painting along. So I had maybe three or four people who asked me for the resource photo. And um, and Alice says, more like studying along. <laughs> and uh, with a frowny face, why? <laughs> that's, that's, I'm sorry that you're not feeling it, but um, it's all practice, right? So, I am, maybe I'm just going to extend this just like 10 more minutes here for you guys and see if I can get quickly some of these adjustments in that are going to really help um, make this um, feel a little bit more um, there. So, that's just... Um, just what I'm going to do here. I'm going to really start analyzing. See that? How much more white I put up here. Because I can see, if I look back and forth, how much lighter that really is. And then there's a little bit of pinks coming in right in here. But it's still very light. Okay, so having control over those values is what really starts to make this thing work. Got some highlights here. And then going a little bit redder. Just moving around quickly, seeing if I can get some of the subtleties in the face closer to where they need to be. Just jumping around, getting, moving around these little piles of paint to try to get the right color. Okay, need to get the crease here in the fold of the upper eyelid. Okay, that looks actually shockingly good for the first attempt. And I'm going to need to soften up this transition right there. So there's something going on in the tip of the nose. I really want to get it. Um, it's like a reddish gray happening. That's really kind of, um, I don't know, 
sort of the skin tones. There's a little bit of makeup there. And then there's light hitting it. So there's kind of all these little influences happening at once and really creating the surface there. And then little mysterious blue colors coming in, grayer colors. I really want to see if I can get that to read the way it's happening up in there. the line of the nose too which is a little bit steeper than what I have and there's a little bit of red too on that far shadow here and I don't know if you see it but there's just a tiny little highlight here that's a little exaggerated but So I'm going to keep on doing this, really moving along quickly to see if I can make enough of these adjustments to really um, improve this quite a bit. Got a little bit more lighter on the side of the nose. It's, it's a very common mistake to exaggerate differences that you see in the painting. Some explain it as that when you focus on something that your, your pupil opens up and you see things a lot brighter, a lot more contrast than it really has. And then other times you don't believe that a difference can be so subtle and still be able to see it. And the trick is sometimes doing the smallest amount of change that will be readable um, and look to see if the change in your painting is as subtle as the change that's in the resource. Okay, I need a little bit of orange in that. One mistake that I often make is that I'll be running out of color on my palette and I won't um, take the time to put out more of that color. So I'll struggle along with uh, the little bit of color that I have left on there. It's, it's a little bit of laziness, um, but then I find if I then get out the tube and put that color down that uh, the thing just um, comes along so much faster. Pull that line down a little bit here. And then I need just a touch of black in that. And then this swings around. Okay, starting to feel a little bit more solid, but it's still not there yet. So I don't have this shadow quite thin enough yet. Giving her a little bit too much nose. The tip of her nose comes right out to this lash right here. So that's actually right. Um, but I'm beginning to wonder is this whole distance right here. That looks right too. So something, something is a little bit off. Maybe it's the angle of her nostril. Could be little things like that that make something that feels like the wrong width or the wrong direction. Okay, 
So if I flick my eyes back and forth between the resource and my painting, then sometimes I can catch what the differences are. Yep, let's just pull this forward a little bit. I think I may have to pull my lips uh, out a little bit further. Sometimes it's it's a very small differences between uh, a drawing that's off and a drawing that's on. It's just um, especially if you you have something that's in perspective, that little bit of change is can be huge. Yeah. So I don't know if that's exactly where I wanted to go with the lips, but let's see. I think I need to pull this down a little tighter. Um, maybe that's starting to feel a little different. Okay, yep. Okay, so let me see if I've missed anything here. Um, more like studying along. Alice, first exam tomorrow. Looking forward to them to be done so I can paint too. Um, <clears throat> too sh oh, so you're not studying painting. You're studying studying. Um, Tushar Wankar. Sorry if I mispronounced that. How to mix a proper color. I mess my paintings by wrong color sometimes. Um, again, just as important as color is value structure, and uh, Sanjeev says, good luck with the exam. I say good luck too. Hey, um, Alice, did you say um, where you are and where you're, st um, where you're going to school? Um, good luck um, wherever you happen to be. And I'm just about to the end here, at least for now. Um, I could do this all night but I'm not sure you want to watch me all night. Um, if you do want to continue watching me, just let me know, and I will keep on painting. Otherwise, I will um, I will call it a night, and you guys can then feel free to go about your, your lives. Just... Um, Working on the subtleties here is basically what I'm focused on. Um, so, Alice, yes, I'm from um, Australia. I'm studying paramedicine. Um, it's tough, though. I don't think, yeah, that does sound tough. Um, is that Sydney, Melbourne, somewhere else where, um, where you're studying? Um, Jonathan says, don't stop. Okay, I, I will keep on going. <laughs> Even if it's just me and Jonathan. Um, James says, I want to keep on watching you paint. Okay, I'm, I'm feeling encouraged. I'm going to keep on going. Um, because I think um, for some people this might be where, um, uh, where they're kind of missing out. Is sort of that, um, that fight to to get things to work and I always say this I um, when I looked at I've, I had some very successful paintings and they came kind of seem like accidents like sometimes I could get it and sometimes I didn't and I didn't understand like well how come I just can nail it sometimes and other times I can't seem to um, it does seem like, you know, when the paintings that I see of painters that I like, they just seem to be um, painted so rapidly, so freshly, but so exact. Um, but they seem to be able to do it so consistently. And I, was, and I had a hard time, like, understanding, like, how can they be just so precise like that? Um, like, a, 
sensor or something, you know, just attacking the painting and just have every stroke be right. And um, so I started to watch videos of some of the painters I liked. One is um, is Jeremy Lipking, whose paintings are just amazing, by the way. So um, if anyone um, wants to see work that I admire, yeah, we'll go check out some of his paintings. And um, another one is um, Dan Gearhart's, and I and um, Morgan Wessling is another one. A little bit different genre of painting than. Um, than I like um, personally. I mean, would I want to paint? I mean, I like looking at his work, but um, the same with Dan Gearhart's a little bit, um, his paintings are a little bit too sweet um, for my taste, but I, I really love the color and the brushwork. And so I watched some of their videos and and an interesting thing I noticed is how slowly they painted. Uh, I mean, there would be some areas where they were painting quickly, but overall, there was this tempo um, to their painting that was so slow. And but still, their work was their brushwork uh, was loose and rapid looking, and so there was sort of this disconnect between what the what the painting looked like and how it actually was painted. Um, so it made me realize that um, I didn't have to have this kind of um, marksmanship idea of how I painted, that it didn't have to be perfect um, from the beginning. And I, if I wanted the finishing strokes to be on the mark, it was all about slowing down and and being much more careful in the strokes to be able to get um, that kind of precision that I was looking for. It wasn't these kind of rapid strokes that I thought. Um, it was really this measured slowing um, down, this patience. I guess patience is a good word because it was not, um, it wasn't what I was thinking about th that was required. I wasn't thinking about that it required patience. When I looked at these um, Alla Prima paintings, it, especially if you, you know, you're you looking at a lot of time lapses, you don't get that sense of patience that's required. Um, and you can see there are some areas of the painting that I'm repainting maybe for the 10th time until it starts to feel right. Um, I'll go ahead and wipe it out and paint it again. I don't care um, until, because I know eventually I'm going to get there. So that patience, I think, also is what, um, what a lot of artists are missing in their work. Some have the patience, but they don't have the skills. Um, they haven't developed the skills to be able to know how to control the the paint, how to um, create structure, how to um, understand the anatomy of what they're painting to to make it feel real or believable or to feel solid or even ideas of color and composition. So um, those sort of deliberate choices that an artist makes to to make sure their paintings are interesting, um, that's um, those that's required too along with that patience. Um, so let me see. I want to keep watching you paint. Alice says Melbourne. Um, Jose, watching from Paris, California, Jonathan, uh, but please don't feel pressure. If you've got to get to bed, don't miss, don't miss your ride. Um, no, I'm used to painting till two in the morning. So if I go to bed now, I'll wake up at three in the morning. Um, let me see. Mario Olivetto waiting for the earring. Oh, okay. 
I, I was thinking so abstractly, like I was thinking like a bell was going to ring or something. Um, maybe my poor microphone. Um, but so yes, the, the earring, um, Mario, I'll get there eventually. Um, Alice uh, W is painting a hobby for you or some pocket money. What do you do full time as a career? Okay. So Alice, I, um, I sort of, uh, well, I'm in, in the creative field, um, one way or another, although it's hard to say how much of what I do is actually creative. I do, um, full time. I work as a, um, front end web developer, but I got there initially as an illustrator, then a graphic designer, then a web designer, then a web, um, an interactive designer, then a web developer. Um, but I've always kept on painting to one degree or another. And so, um, I do it as a hobby. Um, it's, I now thinking it as a, as a life passion and I will keep on painting and I intend on painting to this, um, this pace, I guess you would say, or this, um, to this level of frequency until I die, I think. Um, and for me, I want to continue to improve my skills and improve the enjoyment and, um, want to make sure that I continue to paint what interests me and not worry about whether I'm going to make money off of it. But that said, uh, the better that I get at painting and the more that I, um, engage a following on social media, the more opportunities I have to, um, get portrait commissions and sell my work and, um, so I think eventually, in an odd way, my um, hobby is making my work more um, more marketable um, than if I was as if I had set out to to create um, a career out of painting. So I'm kind of feeling like I want to keep it as a hobby and keep on making money from it if that's. Um, that's what happens, but it's not going to change how much I paint or when I paint or how I paint. So, um, so that's why I don't mind thinking of it as a hobby. Okay. So I'm going to kind of carve that ear a little bit and then eventually get to that earring. So um, a little bit about the colors for these dark, these um, shadows, especially the ear, the nose, a little bit in the nose. I use a, a lizard permanent. That's a gambling color. It's a substitute for a lizard crimson, which is known to be a fugitive or not light fast color. So a lizard permanent is a substitute that kind of gives you that nice, rich, um, transparent um, magenta color. It's, um, I used to miss my alizarin um, crimson. That's the, uh, that's the color that's replacing. And, uh, but now I realize that I can get just about everything I want with a combination of the alizarin permanent dioxazine purple and the quinacridone red can just get uh, combinations of those colors. I can just about get any color of pink, purple, mauve, and um, reddish, bright reddish shadows or rich red shadows. So um, again, back to having a high key and fairly um, transparent in some colors um, palette is that I it really gives me a very wide latitude to be able to to reach a lot of different colors, colors and values. Okay, let me 
do a quick measurement again from uh, from the earlobe. So let me see. I know I've missed a few questions here. Um, Yeah, I don't think I'm low enough in the ear. Yeah, I'm a, I'm about an inch too high. How does that happen? I thought I measured it. I lowered it. I. Yeah. So that means that this must be too high too. Oh yeah, look at that. So I gotta look at. I think right about here in the nose. Yeah. So that's the top of my ear there. So that's definitely gonna interfere with getting the gesture to feel right if I have the ear uh, a full inch too high. So. Sorry about that. Spent a lot of time painting that ear in the wrong place, but um, but I don't care. Just as long as it all looks good in the end. It's, um, I have nothing better to do than to, to repaint an ear anyway. Okay, so um, it's painting a hobby for me. Um, oh, good. Now I don't feel um, bad about my. Um, my painting so slowly, um, says Diane. Mario, um, your microphone is working fine. My PC was off. Oh, okay. Well, um, that would explain it. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm assuming now that my um, phone is actually charging because it hasn't died yet. So um, good thing there. Um, Alice, um, thanks for sharing. What type of brushes do you use? So I buy just about the cheapest brushes I can. The one I have right now is a Princeton brush. I got it on sale in um, Dick Blick. Um, I don't like paying more than a few dollars a brush. I know there's lots of brushes out there you can spend 20 and $30 on. And um, if you look at my brushes, they're all pretty much worn down to, to nubs. <laughs> I really do abuse them. I um, I try to keep them clean, but sometimes I leave them sitting in the in my um, brush cleaner, and um, the which is okay for most brushes. The my detail brushes start to get um, kind of curled up a little bit, and um, um, but um, um, other than them buying the cheapest brushes I can get, I like to have a mixture of bristle um, brushes and synthetic brushes that are softer. And when I say synthetic, I could also spend money on sable brushes, but um, those are really a fortune, quite dear, and uh, and I'm not sure I would treat them very well. So I just rather use synthetic brushes for that. They're generally made for acrylic paints, but they work just as well for oils and um, maybe they dissolve a little bit in turpentine but they seem to hold up okay in Gamsol and um, and so um, so the synthetic brushes are soft the bristle brushes are hard and I use them in different ways in different points in the in the Alla Prima process if I want to mix a lot with the underlying paints or push the paints around I'll want to use the the thicker brushes the stiffer brushes rather and if I'm looking to um, keep most of the color that I have in the brush I'll start using progressively softer brushes um, sometimes the br the softer brushes are easier too to get a lot of paint on too the, the panel. So sometimes in the beginning I'll use them um, like that. You can hear I have this stiff brush and it's um, kind of like working the paint in. Whereas if I have a similar 
size softer brush, which I'm having a hard time finding. Where is that brush I was using? I put it down and I lost it. Um, okay, oh here. Okay, so here's the softer brush. It's, it's a bit smaller, but if I have the same paint, I have to make sure I have enough paint on on the brush. This still is a little bit stiff, though. You can hear it. Um, but it um, you can get some of the paint to go on much quicker. Although, this brush is making a liar out of me. Anyway, so beyond the different um, hardness and stiffness and softness of brushes, you also have different brush shapes which can do different things. Um, I tend to like um, having flats or brights which have a kind of a um, chisel or a squared shape to them. And, um, and the other shape I really like is filberts which have uh, it's kind of hard to um, explain their shape. They're sort of oval oval shaped. I'm sorry for yawning. And all of my um, filberts are pretty worn down, but here's a big one. Um, here's a nice big filbert. It has these kind of shape to it. Um, and it's really good for um, painting hair or fabric or passages of light that are in the face and really um, accentuating the, the sense of um, of the brushwork. Um, the flats or the um, brights are really good for creating sort of more of a chiseled look. Um, I like the, the brights or the flats because you can change the angle and paint detail areas with the with the corner or the edge, or you can turn it flat and paint a much wider area so that you can go a longer period of time just using the, the same brush. And um, and I like them especially when they're new. They really do. I have to say it, I have to admit it, that all my brushes that I'm using right now are kind of worn down and they're past their prime. And I get much better paintings when I actually have newer sets of brushes. I just haven't um, ordered new ones. There's a local store that I go to, artists and craftsmen, that um, they have usually a, a pretty good um, um, brush, um, discount brushes, and I haven't stopped um, by there lately to get new brushes. Um, also, I occasionally pick up um, brushes on sale on Dick Blick, and um, I haven't um, bought new brushes in a while, so that is um, something I have in my mind to do soon because I don't want the, um, the quality of my, or the state of my brushes, I should say, to affect um, the quality of my work. Um, if you notice here, her flesh tones go very cool, very blue in the shoulder and, and um, towards her chest. Um, even much more pronounced blue in the shoulder. Almost looks like it's a um, different person or different light. Um, I am going to push it um, a little bit cooler, but I'm going to try to keep it um, more uniform than it looks in the, in the photograph. And to help that, I need to paint this black that's behind it, or at least start to indicate it. And I need this to feel like it's the same hor horizon line going across. So I need to, to pull that back down a little bit. Okay. Sort of lost my focus a little bit here. Um, I am going to have to do a lot of adjusting of the drawing as I go through that ear. Um, so I just left in a horrible state, which is okay as long as I eventually get back to it. And, and actually, when, it's not going to necessarily take that much to make it, um, bring it back to something that's readable. If I carefully put in some of the darks and the lights. And sometimes it's about painting slowly. see. <clears throat> 
so um, let me see. Got to get back to my questions. Um, uh, Alice said, thanks for sharing. What type of brushes do you use? I think I answered that one. Um, then Jonathan says, where are you from? I currently live in Baltimore. Um, been here for the last um, 20, 20 years, almost exactly. Um, next year will be 20 years. Um, but I've also lived in Ecuador, New York City, Los Angeles, grew up in Los Angeles, went to school at UC Santa Barbara, I got an engineering, mechanical engineering degree from there, and also then later went back to school at Art Center College of Design and have an illustration degree from there, um, Masters of Fine Art in Illustration. So. Um, and so you can say I lived kind of all over and I've studied a pretty wide range of subject matter. <clears throat> okay, starting to, starting to see this a little bit more. Okay, so you can see in the flange of the nose I have this sort of darkish color painted here. Um, but what I need to see is some of the subtlety. So what I don't see is there's a little bit of a value change on the upper edge here. And that's t that's giving me information about how this is pointing. It's pointing upward on one side, curves around, and then I have just a little bit of light that's hitting right. Uh, well, I overdid it. but nice thing about some of these paints is it's really easy just to knock it back and start again. Or knock it back a little bit until it looks right. So it's just a little bit of orange that's there. And then it gets a little bit of highlight right on the edge of that. And that's going to give me some of the information that I need to understand what the form's doing there. It's like little subtle clues. But you kind of have to know what you're looking for by understanding what the anatomy is doing. So if I know that anatomy is turning and then I go to look to see, well, how do the little changes of value and color help me understand what it's doing, then then you start to see it. Only then when you when you know to look for it. And that's one of the tricks is that um, you only get to be a better painter by understanding what it is that you're trying to paint. Okay, a little bit of red there. And the same thing with this the shadow side of her nose here. There's little clues to tell it tell us like how these smaller areas are changing direction. So I have this, if you think of this as kind of a little bit of a slope here, that's um, softening as it comes into this crease. And then on the other side, it's fairly pink or pinkish gray here on the side. A little bit of purple in there actually. keep it light enough. And then there's this transition here to, to being the side of the nose. So I think I'm getting a lot closer to it now. And then right on top of that, let's see if I have enough white in my palette still. It's really facing right at the light and it's catching, um, it's reflecting the light directly back at us. has a little bit of texture to it. I can decide whether I want to keep that texture or really want it to be a thick area of paint where you just f kind of feel the paint sitting on top of the painting. And then this gets really narrow around here, around that um, crease in the nose. And when you start to get that subtlety in there, 
then it starts to feel like something. Okay, I'm going to pull out one of my little detail brushes, but I'm going to try to remember to not hold on to it for too long because it can be very dangerous in the wrong hands. I got a little bit of bright pink here. Oh, I forgot what I was going to paint with this thing. So there's this little highlight here that's on the edge of the nose. Try to go slowly because there's no rush here. Patience, right? Okay, so that's reading about right. And then there's some lights coming down around there. And then in the um, filtrum right here, I made it a little bit too narrow. And then this turns a little bit bluer as it comes up. And then I need to sneak in a little bit of orange or pink into the shadow and I need to keep it fairly dark or else it's uh, it's lighter than everything else around it but um, it's still pretty dark and then like that okay and so now I'm careful about the shadow here still I want to keep that pretty dark near the tip but then it comes out a little bit right here for the nostril and stays fairly thin and subtle till right about there. Okay. So, and I want to carve into it a little bit on this side to make it just a little bit thinner. Okay. So, it's actually feeling a little bit, something feels a little bit too long in here and I think it's the the base of the nostril right there. Could be wrong. And the shape of the tip of her nose is a little bit rounder up here. Not quite as pointy as I have it. I'm really using a little bit of a dark purple. And it's very subtle, that, that edge. And then I need to broaden the nose a little bit right here. So I'm going to bump that out a little. So it's just these little subtle changes, but very, um, they're very carefully painted. And so look right here, see how light the oranges I have here, and I, and I know you really can't see it in this photo, but I can see it pretty well. It's a dark orange, so orange mixed with a little bit of black or some other of the darker reds and purples to get it the right value. Just, okay, I've been holding on to that detail brush a little too long, and then do you see what happened? I started trying to paint a much bigger area with it and just losing the life of the painting there. Okay, so where, where am I? <clears throat> so Jonathan says, my local um, store is called Artists and Craftsmen's too. Um, so, my, so Jonathan, did you say where you're from? You probably did earlier on. Um, uh, let me see. You said um, coming from Brooklyn. Oh, so there must be more than one um, artist and craftsman. That that's an unusual enough name to. Um, Coincidentally, have two different unrelated stores with that name. 
so I bet they're a chain of some sort. I remember when I lived in New York, Pearl Paint was the big art chain. Um, but I don't think they got an online presence quick enough. And um, Dick Blick and Cheap Joe's and um, those sort of um, entities, Artist Warehouse kind of got the, kind of beat them to the punch on that one. Um, okay, so. Let's see where I am in all this. So let's see if I can um, get some car carve into the hair a little bit to get the um, her head feeling like it's pointed. It's leaning back really. So I have her. I gave her too much hair on that side. Let's look at the top of her head too. Oh, I just pulled the um, the brush um, brush right off of the handle. That's I sometimes I pull on it a little bit too hard when I'm, I'm cleaning cleaning it. Okay, I can go darker green, blue, gray up above her head, like in the photo, which is nice. So sometimes you um, you want kind of a flat color in the background, but you don't want it to be completely flat. You want it to gradate from one side to the other, from the top to the bottom, to, to create a little bit more interest and a sense of light. So you do want to look to see where where it's shifting, because that does add more interest to to the painting. Okay, more interest, more light. Um, um, similar kind of things to it, to the edge control. You want to vary your edges um, throughout the painting. And so I know some of you are going, well, what is that edges? So, and this is where um, there's nothing like a la prima painting because it gives you the ability to create really hard and soft edges hard edges, meaning that there is just a very sharp line between where two values or colors um, change. And then you can have areas where that that separation is very soft, can be a few millimeters or an, an inch or two before the value completely changes. Um, I'm not just talking about passages of from light to shadow, it could be an area from the hair to the background can be very soft and that softness tends to feel like something's moving back in space or is further away. When uh, edge is very hard it feels like it's coming, it's jumping out towards you and so being able to vary that helps create a sense of depth and interest in the painting. A good painter to look at maybe not look at because um, you really wouldn't be able to tell from a photo or online, but to see in person is um, Vermeer paintings. There's such a mastery of edges in his paintings. It's just um, really quite sublime when you see it in person. Um, if you have a chance, um, go see every Vermeer that you can. They're kind of rare and hard to see in person, um, but occasionally you'll get to see, there'll be shows around that will have a good selection. There's a, maybe about 35 Vermeers known in the world, and some of the major museums do have one or two of them. Um, and I have seen some shows where there's been several in, in one show. Um, when I say several, like 20 or 25, and it's and it's just amazing to see. So I've given her too much forehead, um, so I want to um, want to trim that a little bit, but I want to keep it um, keep it true to the painting. I'm true to the photo and the proportions, so. This cuts in here, comes down. Okay, that 
looks a little bit better. And then I'm going to come back in with my reds and oranges. Um, so one of the things I was saying is that I um, get a little bit lazy about putting more paint out. And I've been suffering from not having any orange. So have my permanent orange here. I'm putting a big dollop down so I don't have to fight not having orange anymore. Okay, so, oh, okay, wow, it went an hour more than I thought. So 11.30, I think I am going to call it, and because uh, that'll be two and a half hours, and I think um, YouTube will start to send the police after me if I keep on going. They, I don't know if there's any limit, but um, in a world where videos are only four or five minutes long and I'm doing a, a two and a half hour painting. Um, I, I have a feeling that um, some of my shorter um, demos get more tutorials, demos, demos get more views because people see, oh, this one's only an hour and a half as opposed to one that they'll say, oh, that one's three hours. I'm not going to click on that. Um, but I uh, get significantly more uh, watch time out of the longer ones, um, which is something that um, that YouTube likes. Even if it's fewer people that view it, they'll um, when they view it, they'll watch a little bit longer. So um, behooves me to do to keep on um, painting and not um, quit uh, quit the uh, session so early. I mean, I will work on this um, still after I end the video. Um, maybe not tonight, um, but um, over the week. I have um, sort of a commission that I'm working on right now. It's, um, when I say it's sort of commission, it's one that I started as a demo that, um, that I have an interested buyer when it's complete, so. I do want to finish that one at some point. Um, and it's almost complete. It's one, if you look at my older demos, it's one that I started a couple weeks ago called Beauty. And um, it's coming along nicely. I've posted on Instagram some of the progress of it. And I'm really happy with the way it's coming out. So I'd like to um, finish it before I ruin it. <laughs> And or before the paint completely dries on it, and um, okay, so still off a little bit in some places. So you remember I said I did the fold of that eye; it really came out perfect. And but now I kind of want to change the shape a little bit to have it come up a little bit faster at first. Just a slight um, angle change and then come across there. Okay, uh, that wasn't so hard. And then the eyelash here just comes up a little bit higher. Just indicate a little bit there. And okay, so. <coughs> So here's something that you guys have been waiting for, the magic. So this is where some of the magic happens, is just um, once you get all the values right, um, then you can come in with just a tiny little highlight, and it will just make everything perf seem just like, I don't know, go from being OK to just um, kind of wow. So let's, um, let's, let me get the pupil just right in the right place first, because that's something that's going to be hard to change later. Really want her to feel like she's looking at us. So getting the, getting this placement is really important. And want to stay, get, keep the green dark enough right in here. Okay. So that's looking pretty good. So let's get, I think this is the right brush for the highlight. So what I did is just put a 
dollop of paint right on the tip of this detail brush and I just want to lay it on top right there. Okay, so is that feeling the way I want it to? I think so. And then I want a little bit of light blue right in here. And then just that same, a little bit darker blue right along the the edge of the lid right here. And okay, one little more adjustment is shaping the, the eyelid right there, just making the eyelashes a little bit higher. Okay. So now I'm starting to feel that eye. Let's come bring that down a little. I get a little bit of, again, another highlight right here in the tear duct. Let's do it. Do it again. Okay, there. And then the other side of that lid comes down there. So now I'm really like um, emphasizing little bits of the anatomy of the eye, giving it structure so that you can feel the roundness of it. I need just a very subtle little um, highlight, not highlight, that I need the white of the eye just to get a little bit lighter right by the iris. <clears throat> and then, so this is, you know, a good place to keep on holding on to this little detail brush. I'm really going to hit it heavy, the white. That's this iridescent um, eyeshadow here. It's going to pile up the white a little bit. And then I'm going to just refine where the fold is there. And just one little touch more for the eye is just to darken that shadow just a little bit for the crease of the eyelid. Okay. So at least um, the eye in that painting, in the painting, is starting to feel like where I want the whole rest of the painting to be. And just um, just add some indication of the eyelashes. Don't have to go crazy over it. I just need to start to feel it a little. That one I feel a little bit too much. And then the eyeliner, make it exaggerated like she has it. So. Um, just a little bit more to emphasize the roundness of the eye is the the shadow, the cast shadow from the eyelid onto the white of the eye. So the blue just gets a little bit darker there. Okay. Let's soften that up a little. Great. I really love starting to like the look of that. Okay, great. So that's a great eye. Or at least I like it. Um, and now I can do, try to do the same thing to some of the area, other areas of the painting. Really pull out um, the things that make it um, feel, I don't know if real is the right word, because I'm not really going for a sense of realism. I just want it to feel like it's the thing that I'm painting. <clears throat> I want you to be able to see the paint, but also see the thing that is being painted both at the same time. And not, I 
think a lot of times photorealism tries to hide the paint and I want people to see it. Okay, I have that cheek here a little bit too dark. I like the look of it, but I want it to want the value structure of the face to hold up so I really need to kind of make this cheek much lighter and then I need to exaggerate then the highlight um, on the top of the cheek. Okay that's feeling a little bit better. So pink there. If you remember, that's where I repainted the lips. I moved them over, and so there's still quite a bit of red paint underneath there that I need to cover over. Okay, so I haven't completely lost all of you. At least Alice is probably there just um, working away on her homework. And uh, that's fine. At some point, I'm going to have to do some morning tutorials because I feel really sorry for my European followers who. Um, if they really want to see what I'm doing, have to be up in the middle of the night, which um, I can understand not wanting to do that. Um, so if I do a weekend morning at some point, I think that would make some of those, um, those people really happy. Okay, building up the, um, the neck muscle, I forget what, that, what that's called, jugular, but it's the muscle that the tendon that leads from the back of the head there. It's actually two separate tendons. So it allows you to turn your head from side to side. And so she has this one abducting a little bit um, to allow her to turn towards us. background in here to change the, the angle there a little bit. Okay. Okay, that's starting to look better. Just getting re um, changing that that um, can't even talk right now. Just changing the location of that edge, re redrawing it a little bit. Okay, so at some point I did need to do the earring for um, who was asking about the earring. for, where is it? No, I lost
lost it. Okay. I know. I I can search. Okay. Yes, Mario was waiting for the earring. So why didn't I um, start to indicate that, even though the ear isn't really completely there yet? So with the earring, I'm just going to do come in with some black. I know about the placement and shape. So I need the black because for to, for something to feel metallic, you need the contrast between light and dark. And so it's that it's not enough just to have light. Have <coughs> sorry, water. I need my my voice is going. So to have feel something to feel metallic, you need both that um, that very dark dark and the very light light and very little in between. There's a little bit of gray in there, but not a lot. So um, so without that that really dark dark that sense of metallic isn't going to be there. In fact, I just kind of wiped out the black there, so I'm just trying to get a little bit more of it back in. And I can use the hair here too to push this over. So that's the start of it. I can just come in a little bit cross stroke. What I really need to do is use a, um, a flat here, just pile in the paint. So that isn't perfect, but you start to get the idea. Let's get some of the, the dark that's in there too around it. So, so even the, the dark, the shadow in the neck is partially what's supporting that the illusion of the light hitting that metal surface. So that's slowly starting to read. It's going to take a little more work, but it's starting to get the idea. <clears throat> OK, I think I'm just going to go for a few more minutes here. I am starting to get a little tired. And, uh, and you guys have been great hanging in there with me. Um, <clears throat> Make sure you didn't have any new questions. So, um, oh yeah, Mario asked about the earring. It's only 2.30 here, so it's perfect. Um, 2.30 p.m. So that's Alice in Melbourne. Um, 
and uh, James asks, do you do master in still life studies? So I used to do a lot more of still lives, um, partially because um, if you want to be a gallery artist, that still life is a genre of painting that can be very saleable. And I, when I was in school, I had um, done some studies in my classes, still lives that were extremely successful. I didn't sell them, but I knew that there was a quality of work that I could sell. And um, so I did often go back to trying to replicate um, the quality of those still lives, and I had done some in recent years. But um, when it really comes down to it, I've decided that I need to stick to the, th the thing that I do. <laughs> the thing that I do is painting, is doing these studies, these um, gestural paintings of people. And, um, and, 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 and if I need to um, not paint still lives and not paint landscapes, um, be able to focus in on that. Um, I don't care. I don't care if I never paint another still life again. If I can keep on painting people, that's that's fine with me. Um, I know that it's um, something that's easier for people to buy a still life um, than a portrait of somebody that they don't know. But um, again, I have to go back to what it is that I'm I'm passionate about. So I keep on um, keep on going back to that sort of touchstone. Is it is this the kind of painting I want to be doing? I want to grow from, and um, still lives not so much, and um, portraits yes. So so that's what I'm doing. Um, master studies. Oh, so you asked about master copies, master studies. Um, I think at some point I will start doing more, maybe some sergeants or something like that, because um, it's my firm belief is that it's a great learning tool to be able to paint, um, paint the masters both in the style that they painted it and also to repaint it in your own style. Um, both um, either can be um, a very um, useful tool for understanding what they're doing. You can study a painting, but until you paint a painting, you don't really completely understand it. And, uh, and even after you paint it, it may be hard to really comprehend. But if you really want to get your skills up in a, in a very quick um, period of time, Doing master studies is one of the best ways to do that because um, you can paint from a photograph and there's there's lots of, uh, if you know, understand the anatomy and a value structure and um, how to create the sense of form, um, the photos are only can get you so far because the photos kind of hide. Um, how, how to explain it, they hide how something becomes three-dimensional looking, becomes something, how something becomes real looking. And when you study the masters, all the clues are there, all the little brush strokes and value changes and um, color changes that help create that illusion there, it's there for you to see, to learn from. And once you've done those copies, you're kind of absorbing that information. Um, even if you don't completely realize it, every time you do it, you're, you're picking up new ideas and new skills. And so I think there's a huge value there. What I haven't done, I've done my master's um, copies from books primarily. And I see now more museums are putting out um, 
permanent easels for artists to come and use, um, which there's a museum I was at recently that had them. Um, it may have been the Met. No, it was the National Gallery. The National Gallery has them. So they're kind of saying to artists, like, yes, we under we appreciate that this is a, um, a valuable learning tool to be able to come to this museum and paint. So they have them set up there. I haven't taken advantage of them yet, but I do. I would like to at some point go and um, use one of the easels they have set up there. Um, I guess in my mind, I, I think of it's like, well, who would want me to slosh paint around in their museum? And But they do have these easels. They have a mat underneath it. So if you, you're splashing a little bit of solvent there, it's um, not spilling out all over their wood floor. Um, so um, it is possible to go there and do that. see and um, okay. so this isn't looking so bad it's about three quarters the way there I am going to probably stop for tonight I do want to put in um, some of this highlight here if I have enough white paint to do it no I think I need to put out a little more white before I go and glob that on <clears throat> so yeah, so uh, you can go a little bit thicker towards the end of the painting, especially if you want to build up some of the highlights, the textures um, for interest, and uh, this will really um, help the eye, especially when the white paint sits kind of right on top, it really does feel like um, reflected light, and, and it also um, pulls that part of the painting forward towards the viewer. Just a little bit of white here, top of this chin. Okay, let's see if I can fix this um, this contour right here of her cheek. to pull again this line of her neck back just a little bit. Okay, so I I need to to work on this a little bit, but her head is tilted back, but the way that I have her neck painted, I have don't have it really feeling like it's um, that there's this tension in the back of her neck that there should be so I may have to play with that a little bit but I like I like where it is right now I'm just gonna put in a couple more highlights and then I'm gonna call it a night so you guys have been great hanging on with me if any of you haven't subscribed and um, click the notification icon I um, encourage you to do it that way you'll get notified when I um, post um, future videos if you've um, found this helpful um, well that does that's really helping there and a little bit of highlight more highlight there so now um, I think you can start to feel the the, the moisture on her face, that little bit of um, sheen that she has um, with some of those highlights. I, I think it's one of the things that attracted me to this photo in the first place, so it's good that I'm starting to get, get some of that in. And feeling of like some light hair that's um, there on her, her uh, cheek. I can't even speak anymore. 
She has a birthmark there, but it's really just some paint on my monitor. or hair there that's coming in. Okay. And let's get some of the bluer, greenish color that's coming in right there. And then this is a great place to kind of get the dimension um, of the hair, feeling like it's coming forward or at us. And this kind of thing you want to do kind of towards the end. You don't want to have these um, thick passages of paint over top when you do have to continue to adjust colors um, around it. So I just went ahead and did that, even though I may decide to make some changes later, but hopefully not. Okay, I think that's uh, that's looking pretty good. I'm going to do a little bit more on the lips. Give her a little bit of that um, upturned lip there. Okay. You can see just a hint. Sorry, I keep on going. I'm like the um, Ever Ready Bunny there. See a little bit of her teeth on the inside. It's just a slightly lighter purple inside her mouth than the dark that's around it. Just giving you a little bit of a hint there. Okay, so this is a good stopping point. Thank you all for, for watching, and I promise that I will post this soon to Instagram, and I will be doing a new um, demo next week, so you're welcome to come back. Um, one big favor that I ask of you is after I um, close the video, after I shut down, please um, put in a comment after that, um, because right now the video has zero comments, even though you guys have done a great job of asking me questions and posting to the feed. It's not until after the video is over that, um, that it will accept comments. So. Um, please do that if you can, and I'll thank you and have a good night, and I hope to see you next week.